In this presentation, I am going to introduce you to one of the most fascinating eras of world history, in which occurs both the first global scale empire and possibly also the first global scale world war. The era in which this occurred is the mid 3rd millennium BC. This age witnessed the rise to power of Sargon the Great, founder of the Akkadian Empire. The series of conquests by land and seas brought the emperors of Akkad into conflict with many contemporary powers. Some like the Elamites, whose identity and location we have known since we learned of the Akkadian Empire and the Mesopotamians, but many other mysterious lands and people which we have only now begun to place. The scale of this conflict as it appears is astounding. So this will involve the neighbors of Akkad, such as Elam, the sea powers of Dilmun and Magan, and incredibly the Indus Valley Civilization or the Miluhans, along with their allies, the mysterious people of Marahasi. So in presenting this, I have integrated material and evidence from archaeology, inscriptions and textual history, in addition to other sources, and applied geopolitical theory to present not just raw data but to create a narrative history of this great war of civilizations. I hope you find it intriguing and it encourages you to delve further into this underexplored but most interesting era of world history, which truly was the foundational epoch for all that we are today. So if you're interested, you will find a link to an ebook of an extended version of this essay with further readings below and there are also maps and many other insights and additional information. So I encourage you to get that ebook after listening to this presentation. So now before we move on, it is my duty to introduce the sponsor of this video, Atlas VPN. But if you have followed my channel for a while, I have lamented and been very critical of this fragmentation of cyberspace, which ultimately, in my view, stifles humanity's intellectual development and creativity. Now, thankfully, we have an alternative that allows us to rediscover and use the internet as it was meant to be. Atlas VPN was developed by top cybersecurity specialists and IT engineers in 2019, and it was created specifically to make the internet both more accessible and secure. Now, currently, Atlas has more than 6 million users worldwide. So, returning to this question of how Atlas VPN can allow you to both take control of your cyber life and use the internet unrestricted as it was meant to be, and at the same time, secure and safe for you. Take note of these uh, major issues you will undoubtedly experience in cyberspace, sometimes without knowing, and how Atlas VPN can help you solve these problems and really take control of your cyber life. From simple things like circumventing geo-blocking and content restrictions on TV shows, websites, and various information sources, to discovering the best prices for internet shopping, bookings, booking flights, etc. And this is basically part of the overarching problem of preventing corporations or anyone else on the internet from profiling you and pushing certain content towards you. Rather, VPN allows you to experience the internet organically. So right now, Atlas VPN is running a substantial discount. You will find the offer below. And you are getting a 3-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And I would just say honestly that this is a pretty good deal. And if I had come across this anywhere, I would take it immediately. And the best part is that you can use Atlas on an unlimited number of devices. So that is really exceptional. So I would just say, take control of your internet life. And honestly, this is ultimately about you and you using the internet as it was meant to be. Ultimately for the benefit of us all. And with that, now we return to the presentation. Rimush, the king of the world, in battle over Abul Gamash, king of Parasum, was victorious. And Zahara and Elam and Gupin and Meluha Within Parasum assembled for battle, but Hirimush was victorious and struck down 16,212 men and took 4,216 of them captive. Further, he captured Imasini, king of Elam, and all the nobles of Elam. Further, he captured Sidagao, the general of Parasum, and Sargapi, general of Zahara, in between the cities of Avan and Susa, and by the middle river. Further, a burial mound at the side of the town he heaped up over them, 
Furthermore, the foundations of Parasum from the country of Elam, he tore out, and so Remosh, king of the world, rules Elam as the god Enlil had shown. This is from an inscription of Remosh. Now, where did this war occur and who were the parties involved? In addition, of course, to Remosh. And who was Remosh himself? Let us explore this. Remosh was the son and successor of Sargon of Akkad, also known as Sargon the Great. Now, Sargon had risen to power in Sumeria under somewhat dubious circumstances. But just before his rise to power, he was the cupbearer of the king or the Lugal of the city of Kish, which had once been the hegemon of a Sumeria-wide confederacy, to which all others paid their respects and still was the nominal capital of the Sumerian civilization. In the mists of time, there had once been an emperor who ruled from Kesh over all of Sumeria. The hegemony of this Sumerian empire, the first empire of Kesh, had been broken long ago before the time of Sargon by the semi-legendary king Gilgamesh. Since then, an era of competing city-states had prevailed in Sumeria, much like ancient Greece before the Peloponnesian Wars and leading up to the Hellenic Age in which each and all cities competed with one another for power, glory and wealth, fighting wars while recognizing they were all members of one civilizational group and were watched over and worshipped the same gods, who again, like the gods of Greece, also warred amongst themselves and had their petty jealousies and rivalries. Observe this rhythm and the rhyming of history. This is the system of geopolitical order which in terms of world systems theory we might call a society of states, it can also be seen in the warring states period of China and even in Renaissance Italy. And of course, you can think of more examples. In Sumeria, this era of warring states was also, however, one of great wealth and cultural production, as most of the other stated examples also tend to be. To show their one-upmanship over their rivals, the rulers of the city-states built grand temples, adorned these temples and themselves, with luxury goods, gems, precious metals, and exotic materials brought from faraway lands. So, from the eastern Mediterranean coast where Byblos emerged as a great trading city, where the pharaohs of Egypt also sent their agents for gathering precious sedar wood, brought in from the mountains of Lebanon, to the strongholds of Anatolia where cities such as Troy grew powerful by specializing in wealth extraction, silver and gold from the mountainous homeland, to gradual domination of sea trade. From the Caspian Sea region encompassing the Ark and route Mari and Assur, which had become waypoints for trade flowing in from the north and the east, including precious obsidian and other important goods brought in by civilizations of the steppes of Eurasia, nomads who would one day play an important role in the history of all these lands. But now they were mere intermediaries of trade with the great cities, especially the cities of the Oxus, such as Gonor Tepe, and perhaps also another small settlement established by people from the south near the source of a precious mineral, also imported by the Sumerians. This was the settlement of Shortugai of the Harappans, established at a key strategic place at a base near the Lapis Lazuli mines of present-day Badakhshan, and a site from where they possibly also bought Bactrian camels to send their goods over land to northern Mesopotamia and to the bustling cities of Sumeria. So this was the world system of the mid-third millennium BC, from which the competing city-states of Sumeria derived all their wealth and glory. Now since around 2500 BC, the greater Indus Valley civilization had entered its golden age. We spoke of Shortugai, which was the northernmost site of the Harappans, an important presence of the Indus Valley people also existed at the Iranian city of Shah Sokta, where they lived alongside the Elamites. Possibly some merchants from the Caspian Sea region and the Oxus also interacted with the people who arrived here. And all these merchants interacted with the nomads of the steppe lands, who might have been carriers of goods and occasionally hired as mercenaries. Now, such symbiotic relationships between city dwellers, traders, merchants, and nomads characterize life in the Middle Asian region well into the modern age, in the era of the Silk Road, and even till the era of the Great Game in the 19th century. These are the patterns and rhythms of history, which repeat themselves and were established, 
this first foundational epoch of the first stage of civilizations. Now, civilization in the greater Indus region had preceded this age by at least four to five millennia, but around 2500 BC, a small town which had been established as a way station by local semi-pastoralist people to participate in the economic networks of the greater Indus Valley region in the early 3rd millennium BC, largely created by the so-called Kodiji people of the Middle Indus River, had begun to witness a period of rapid growth. The small settlement was Harappa on the banks of the Ravi. This is one of the rivers of the land of the five rivers, the Punjab, which flow into the Indus, making one of the most complex and rich and fertile riverine zones in the world. So by the mid-3rd millennium BC, this town grew into a large city and was possibly controlled by different groups of ruling elites, from five raised mounds built on hillocks, each perhaps belonging to a community or a noble house. The urban sprawl, in a sense, grew in the space between these five hills or hillocks. And the economic rise of the city or the town had perhaps begun to invite migrants from all over the land. We know this as numerous types of burial practices have been found in the cemeteries of Harappa from when it was a mature city, showing that the diversity of religious beliefs of the population might have been encouraged by the Harappans, by the nobles, or at least perhaps have been accepted by the citizenry. So as Harappa reached the status of a world city of its age, something else happened concurrent with this rise. The walled town of Kordiji, a citadel town, which had once dominated the Indus trade from its central position, linking the north-south river system with the west-east mountain route to the northern Indian plains, was destroyed, burned down in a fire. The rise and fall of powers often happens with concurrent cycles of history, as we often see. Who destroyed Kordiji? We don't know. It was burned down and abandoned. And within years of this, on the opposite side of the Great Indus River, a new, magnificent, larger city was built, known today as Mohenjo-daro, and perhaps in that age as Miluha, founded most likely by the Harappans from the north. Mohenjo-daro was a vast city with suburbs of different types, dedicated to the manufacturing of different products and commodities on a comparatively large scale for its age. Here too, the urban growth sprawled below a central citadel mound. Unlike Harappa, there was only one central raised citadel that overlooked the city, a pattern which would be observed in other important cities, especially Dholavira and Lothal, both important mercantile ports, which had been pre-existing settlements it began to grow on the Harappan model in this Harappan age of the Indus Valley civilization with the central pattern of a central citadel overlooking an urban sprawl. Another important city, Rakhigadi, seemed to be more organic, like Harappa. It is also spread over a vast area. It is, in fact, one of the largest cities we have found so far. And it seems to have arisen as a large urban center by the gradual coming together of regional village clusters fusing into a single large settlement over time, perhaps much like Harappa. Excavations at Rakhigari now ongoing will tell us much more. But returning to Mohenjo-daro, which is in a sense one of the best preserved cities of the ancient world across the globe, let us look at the central mound. On the top of the mound, walled away from the rest of the city, was a vast complex with various buildings, including a large warehouse, a vast porticoed building giving the impression of a bureaucratic palace complex with an adjoining assembly hall itself also vast, with pillars which were most likely made of wood brought down from Kashmir down the river. And in addition, there was the famous Great Bath Complex which has become the emblem in a sense of Mohenjo-daro. And from the Citadel Mound, a broad stairway went all the way down right to the banks of where the Indus River once flowed. The course of the river has since shifted. The communications and important dignitaries sailing from Harappa and other cities might have arrived at Mohenjo-daro from here and possibly avoiding the suburbs of the city, climbed up straight to the administrative buildings of the mound to converse with the ruling elite, who were perhaps one of their own. To be recalled is that the Harappans were themselves mound dwellers and the city of Harappa had grown in the space between these seven great mounds. And this pattern of a raised central complex overlooking a vast city would be repeated again and again 
throughout this Harappan civilization. Now, in Mohanjo-daro, precious goods were also stored in the warehouse on the mound of Mohanjo-daro, which we know from remains, and they were sent, perhaps via the Indus along the Makran coast, stopping at way stations such as Aladino, from where they might have sailed down perhaps to Lothal and Dholavira, or perhaps westward along the coast towards the Persian Gulf, where perhaps they replenished their goods at the great coastal city of Sud Kagandor, also a Harappan city, the westernmost city of this civilizational empire. Now, Sud Kagandor was a walled city which was built in the strategic place overlooking the Straits of Oman, which is in a sense a Bosporus of the Persian seas, so placed much like Troy and in a dominant position to control the trade and was also likely watched over by small beacon stations established in partnership with local ruling elite, especially the elite of the area known as Magan, who possibly collaborated with the Harappans. Interestingly, in the tombs of one of the warrior kings of Magan, we have found an Indus seal, which might have been used as an emblem of this relationship. Later, the Maganis themselves, especially in the region of present-day Oman, would build towers on the coasts, so Magan was most likely the name of an ancient civilization which spread across southern Arabia, across the Oman Straits, into Iran and present-day Pakistan where the name survives in the present-day region of Makran. So much like the Byzantine Empire which spread on two sides of the Bosporus or even Turkey today. Now, returning to the ancient world, following the roots of this early trading system, the, so the ports of Meluha and gradually the Maganis began to sail more regularly up and down the coast, linking the Persian seas with the greater Indus River system and the inland trade routes of the Harappan world, and of course the port cities on the western coast of India, with the Gulf. Now in the Gulf, sailing further upward, these boats and these trading systems, now also involving local fishermen communities, will encounter other people, and gradually this nascent world system began to attract more and more participants. A plethora of people, Arabians from the hinterland of the peninsula, who operated an inland trade network extending till the Sinai Peninsula and perhaps even traded with Egypt, in partnership with the Amorites, then upward till the great trading city of Ebla, where merchants from Assur and Mari from Mesopotamia might have also converged with people and merchants from Anatolia. So these arcs began to converge into a truly cross-continental world trading system. Another important arc was built by the so-called Marthu nomads, whom we know from the Mesopotamian records, who lived to the west of Sumeria and might have linked these trading networks with the city-states of Sumeria themselves and also important port cities such as Byblos on the Mediterranean coast and other cities of the so-called Canaanite civilization. Byblos here was a central hub of its own in the eastern Mediterranean arc linked deeply with the Nile Delta and gradually the islands of the Aegean Sea. Now, in the Persian Gulf, the role of Byblos was played by Dilmun, most likely at present-day Bahrain. Also attracted merchants from Elam. Now, these merchants of Elam, which is southern Iran, were forever at war with the Sumerian city-states and might have wanted to avoid the overland trade routes, which ran all the way to the eastern Mediterranean. So perhaps they also developed some port cities in the Persian Gulf on their side of the Persian Gulf and begin, began to participate in this trading network. But in Dilmun, they would of course have had to rub their shoulders, in a sense, with some merchants from the cities of Sumeria, because merchants from Uruk and Ur and the other cities of Sumeria also arrived at Dilmun and perhaps met merchants of Anshan, which was an Elamite city on the Iranian side of the Persian Sea, which possibly also maintained a coastal port and carried out overland trade with the Indus Valley civilization. So a complex trading system already developing now. And what was also developing was perhaps a mercantile code which allowed these merchants free travel and access to various port cities and towns, even in situations where the states and the rulers might have been at war with one another. To understand this, we have to know that geoeconomics in its own right is also an ancient art and often works at variance and sometimes in collaboration with geopolitics as much as it does in a nexus with it. So this nexus of geopolitics and geoeconomics as it operated in the ancient world, there is some indication that just before the rise of Sargon to power, 
the linking of the strait network with Sumeria might have been disrupted temporarily by local wars, as the city-state system of Sumeria had descended briefly just before, before the rise to power of Sargon into a state of disorder. And this temporary disruption in the trading system meant that merchants, especially merchants from the Indus Valley and merchants from other places, might not have been able to arrive in Sumeria, which was a disruption of all those goods which flowed into Sumeria, which created the glory of both the rulers and the gods. And to correct this disruption, a new king had to come to power, and that king was Sarkon. Now we see often in geopolitical history that when a new regime comes to power, especially when its legitimacy is questioned, it poses itself, it proposes itself as a restorer of order. Sargon too came to power as a restorer of order, as a remover of the causes of this disorder, which he identified in his proclamations as the King Lugal Zagisi of Uruk. Lugal Zagisi's actions were identified as the primal cause of disorder in the Sumerian city-states by Sargon who created the new regime. And he claimed, Sargon, King of Akkad, Overseer of Inanna, King of Kish, Anointed of Azu, King of the land, Governor of Enlil. He defeated the city of Uruk and tore down its walls in the Battle of Uruk he won. Took Lugal Zagisi, King of Uruk, in the course of the battle and led him in a collar to the gate of Enlil. Inscription of Sargon from an old Babylonian copy. Sargon also professed to be a man of the people. In restoring the old ways, he proclaimed, My mother was a high priestess, my father I knew not. The brothers of my father loved the hills. My city is Azu Piranu, which is situated on the banks of the Euphrates. My high priestess mother conceived me in secret, she bore me. She set me in a basket of rushes with bitumen, she sealed my lid. She cast me into a river, which rose over me. The river bore me up and carried me to Aki, the drawer of water. Aki, the drawer of water, took me as his own son and reared me. Aki, the drawer of water, appointed me as his gardener. When I was a gardener, Ishtar granted me her favor, and for years I exercised kingship. Ishtar, of course, is the beloved goddess of the people of this land. Then he declared a revival in the New Age. Sargon, king of the world, was victorious in 34 battles. He destroyed the city walls of his enemies as far as the shore of both the seas. He moored the ships of Meluha, Magan and Dilmun at the quays of Akkad. 5,400 men daily eat in the presence of Sargon. He, the god Genlil, gave to Sargon all the land from the upper sea to the lower sea. Sargon became king of the entire world. This is of course royal propaganda. But importantly, notice how he claims to define his legitimacy that he brought back trade to Sumeria. Especially the Miluha trade, which was of course the great trade, trade with the great Indus Valley civilization. The interesting thing is that even till our times, we continue to see politicians, leaders, rulers making the same claims, bringing back trade and prosperity, restoring the old order which has been brought into a state of anarchy by their predecessors and their rivals. And of course, this model of the king of kings, the Shehen Shah, the ruler of all the world, this would also be an invention of the people of this land of Mesopotamia. And right till the Persian Empire in the 4th or 5th century BC, the great king Cyrus and his successors would continue to use the royal titles which were invented by Sargon, including this great title of the king of the four corners of the earth, and also smaller titles such as the king of Elam, the king of the two rivers, the king of the four seas, and various such titles. And of course, Cyrus himself and the Persian Empire would inspire later empires, including that of Alexander. So we see this legacy of kingship, of emperorship, being traced back to this age. Now coming back to Sargon and this claim that he brought back the ships of Meluha, Magan and Dilmun. This is important, since the Meluha trade brought in precious material used to honour the gods. In this propagandistic boasting, there is also a claim of sorts of Sargon as being the restorer of the economic order, the geoeconomic order. Of the world. So the use of geoeconomics for gaining legitimacy is also evident just as much as the use of geopolitics or 
even what we might call divine geopolitics. So Sargon then campaigned extensively to the north and the west. Some records suggest he ravaged Assur, which would be the central city of the later Assyrian Empire, also the great cities of Mari and Ebla, and possibly also raided Byblos. Because an Egyptian source records that around this time of Sargon, the supply of sedar wood from the north was disrupted. So this possibly happened as a consequence of Sargon's raids. But he didn't really have any direct contacts with the Egypt Egyptian empire that we know of, the Pharaonic empire, of course, in the Old Kingdom age. Now, Sargon also possibly fought the Elamites, which was probably a stalemate. He raided the homeland of other semi-nomadic people, including the Guti in the north. The Guti or the Gutians, as they are known, might have been one of the intermediaries of this overland Eurasian trade, which he spoke of, coming, of course, from the Oxus, from cities such as Gonardepe, and perhaps even from Shahre Sokta and Shortugai. All this would have implications. This is a disruption of the trading system, and this will have consequences. So while Sargon was campaigning far and away, there was trouble brewing at home. The city-states of Sumeria were too proud to accept subjugation by a northern barbarian, which Sargon ultimately was. He had intentionally built his capital outside the Sumerian heartland, just to the north, near perhaps where the site of Babylon would later be built. And worse, Sargon had also committed blasphemy by proclaiming himself as a child and the beloved of the gods and the goddesses. And this is a prerogative of the kings of the city-states. So, the city-states of Sumeria revolted. And even as the enemy reached the doors of Sargon's palace, Sargon by this age was an old man, the great emperor, the conqueror, breathed his last and died. Sargon had two able sons, Manishtushtu and Rimush. He was succeeded by Rimush, possibly as Manishtushtu, who is also known as Manishtushu, got busy with suppressing the Sumerian revolts. Rimush began by initiating a series of reforms. He began by identifying royal houses and granting them large estates outside the Sumerian heartland, just to the north around this new capital city of Akkad. And in doing so, he created a new feudal class that would now be loyal to the house of the king, supply manpower and ensure that the king of Mesopotamia, of course, the emperor of the Akkadian Empire, would no longer have to rely on the city-states of Sumeria for manpower. So after consolidating his hold on Sumer, Rimush began a series of campaigns himself, first declaring war against the rival power of Elam, which Sargon had raided but had perhaps failed to subjugate, and then to a land further to the east, Marahasi. This expansion brought him into the sphere of influence of the other great power of the 3rd millennium BC, Meluha, or the civilization of the Harappans. Remember, they had trading contacts from the south, from the seas, and these were old contacts which perhaps pre-existed the rise of Harappans to power. But since the Harappans had come to power, they had also expanded northward into the Central, Adi Central Asian Oxus domain. And here, the two empires would clash as their interests began to diverge from one another in this realm, even as they converged in another. So as I discussed in my presentation on Shortugai, there is a lot of evidence to support the hypothesis that Marahasi was the name of the Oxus civilization where the Harappans had a presence and had old relationships, possibly even kinship associations and intermarriage with local lords, in addition, of course, to geoeconomic ties and trade ties. So imperial expansion and pressure along these networks, linking the nodes of the first world system, which I described earlier, would have domino repercussions, even in that age and in all ages that follow, including our own times. So let's explore this first world war and its beginning. So the pressure in the system had been created perhaps by Sargon's campaigns, but it broke out into a great war during the campaigns of Rimush. Repeated pressure on the trading system. So of this war, which possibly broke out, Rimush recorded in his later inscription. Rimush, the king of the world, in battle over Abal Gamash, king of Parasum, was victorious. And Zahara and Elam and Gupin and Meluha within Parasum assembled for battle. But he, Rimush, was victorious and struck them down. 16,212 men and took 4,216 captives. Rimush captured Emahisini, king of Elam, and all the nobles of Elam, 
Further, he captured Sida Gao, the general of Parasum, and Sargapi, the general of Zahara, in between the cities of Havan and Susa, and by the middle river, further a burial mound at the site of the town he heaped up over them. Furthermore, the foundations of Parasum from the country of Elam he tore out, and so Rimush, king of the world, rules Elam, as the god Enlil had shown. An inscription of Rimush. Now there is a lot of information packed into this inscription. Where are all these lands? We know of Elam, we are quite certain of Meluha, we are quite certain that Avan and Susa were city-states in Elam. Parasum was most likely just to the north of Elam and perhaps could have been a predecessor of the land of Fars. But there are other hypotheses as well. Zahara and Gupin might have been city-states or perhaps they were just uh, the names of peoples or tribes. Most likely they were cities since this is a city-based alliance or confederation of sorts. It was a confederation, the armies of Zahara, of Elam, of Kupin, of Meluha. They all assembled at Parasum for battle, to battle against the armies of the Akkadian Empire. So this was a great civilizational war. Now we don't just go by these claims, we have no doubt based on the material culture that the Akkadian Empire was the superpower of the era. And as Sargon had campaigned to the west and the north, we know this from material remains, Rimush was equally capable of campaigning successfully to the east. And while Elam was no doubt a formidable power, we have no reason to doubt the claim of Rimush that the Elamite army was destroyed and the nobles and the king were captured. And possibly some borderlands between Elam and Sumeria might have been ravaged and brought under the control of the Akkadian Empire. So there was most likely a victory in battle. But we are not sure if there was a substantial expansion of the empire and a consolidation of territory further to the east. A possible reason for this is that while the armies of Elam were defeated and destroyed, the armies of the other city-states including Marahasi which is the Oxus region and Miluha were regional armies and perhaps expanding further eastward might have risked an all-out war with this region and perhaps beyond the capabilities of an empire to manage logistically in that age. Perhaps Rimush realized that or at least Rimush's successor realized that because he would try a different strategy and we will come to that in a moment. What we know is that Rimush soon died. It is possible he was assassinated or killed by a rival. He was succeeded by his brother Manishtushu. We have no way of saying that Manishtushu was to blame but we do know that Manishtushu continued some of the policies and land reforms of his brother. He raised new lords by granting them estates, building manpower for himself, a new system of allegiances with uh, direct vassals and manor lords who owed allegiance directly to the king as a useful way to reduce reliance on the Sumerian city-states. This would also have implications for the perennial power struggle between the city as a political institution and the countryside, also a theme which resonates across historical epochs in geopolitics. Now, interestingly, for uh, people who know about Sumerian history, one of the nobles so raised was a man called Urukagina. Now, Urukagina had been the Lugal of the city of Umma, initially the general and gradually the king. And he had initiated several pro-people programs for the poor before he was overthrown by the newly risen king of Umma's rival city, Lagash, that, uh, that Sargon had imprisoned the band by the name of Lugal Zagisi of Lagash. So there is this complex geopolitics and rivalries between these city-states which, which, are, which are almost as complex as, as any other age, especially the Renaissance and the era of the Peloponnesian War and any other epoch in which the society of city-states and such a system operates. So not to get too deep into this, by making Urugagina, who was a man loved by the people, a lord and his subordinate, Manish Tushu perhaps gained some favor with the people and attempted to do that. And once he was secure, he turned his eyes to imperial expansion. This time, the Akkadian emperor turned his armies and navies southward. The inscriptions he left behind state that Manish Tushu sailed into the seas with a vast navy, down the Persian Gulf to conquer, where he was met in resistance by a coalition of 32 kings. Before we get to the question of who these 32 kings were, we see a change in imperial strategy. From overland conquest, which perhaps was difficult to extend imperial control eastward deep into the heartland of Eurasia, 
we now see a shift in strategy to sea power and perhaps to dominate these sea trade routes and derive their wealth from there. So now, who were these 32 kings who made a coalition again, just like the coalition against Rimush, a coalition against Manish Tushu, to fight a naval battle and resist him in the Persian Sea? Let us turn to that. Now, the port city of Dilmun had a settlement pattern which suggests that there was a kingship, and later in Mesopotamian records, we hear of a queen of Dilmun. But surely a port city could not have had more than a few kings, even if so. Some kings could have entered the war from the Iranian coastland, of course, from the Elamite cities of Anshan and other coastal cities. The Elamites were subjugated by the Akkadians, but not all of them. It is also likely that as Luhan merchants both lived and operated in the Persian Gulf, some of the so-called kings could either have been mercenaries hired by the Indus Valley people or generals of a force commanded from the walled city of Sudkagandor. Remember, we spoke about symbiotic relationships of city dwellers and merchants with nomads whom they hired as mercenaries, in addition to using as intermediaries for trade. So perhaps some of these 32 kings were hired by these people to fight on their behalf. Beyond this, we cannot really speculate as this is all the information we have. But patterns of history repeat and geopolitical patterns and geopolitical theories suggest that this might have been the case. Now, what were the consequences of the battle? While Manish Tushu and his proclamations claim to have won the battles and ravaged many cities, it is possible that a land army operating on the coast in coordination with the navy did achieve this. Again, there is little evidence that Akkadian influence expanded along the coast, at least deep into the coasts of the Persian Gulf. On the contrary, in the age right after this battle, in the generations that follow, we see Dilmun achieving a greater prosperity as a trading hub. And we also see Magan, that is Western Magan in present-day Oman, rising to a higher level of civilization. Interestingly, we see evidence of the construction of towers at roughly 25-mile distances along the coasts in the Straits of Oman. Now, this is a distance that a ship or a boat possibly traveled in a day. So this is infrastructure being built to control and secure this trade by local kings, local rulers of Oman or Magan. I would argue that even many of the kings from the Battle of the 32 Kings might have been from this greater Magan region. And after winning the war, they became more powerful and began to control this trade. The Magan, of course, like I mentioned before, extended on both sides of the coasts. That is, of the coast of the Straits of Oman in present-day southern Arabia and the Iran-Pakistan borderland. So this was a vast region. And a resource-rich region, especially rich in copper, which began to be heavily mined and exported all around the region, especially into Mesopotamia and into other regions as well. So these kings could have been supported financially or strategically by the Harappans, who might already have connections with powerful local families from their regional headquarters at Sutkag and Dor, which, remember, is a walled city overlooking the straits. So when such a settlement is built, it is built for a geostrategic purpose, to control the region. Now, is there more evidence to support this hypothesis? Now, in subsequent years and generations, there is more and more interaction between the merchants of the greater Indus Valley civilization and the people of the Persian Gulf, including more evidence of the residence of a Harappan diaspora in both Magan and Dilmun. We get evidence that Indus Valley seals and writing were now being produced in the Persian Gulf. These are called the Persian Gulf seals. And you can look them up online. These are very similar to the Indus Valley seals, but they have slight regional variations. So it is hypothesized that they were modeled on the Indus Valley seals. They were made and written by people who developed their own alternate culture, perhaps based on the mother culture. So it is hypothesized that they could have been second or third generation descendants of the people who first settled into this land. In small trading colonies, most likely, invited by the local rulers. What happened to Akkad, the Akkadian Empire? So Manish Tushu faced repercussions. He was most likely also killed in a palace coup and replaced by his son, Naram Sin, as the new emperor of Akkad. Now, Naram Sin was an emperor in the mold of his grandfather, Sargon. He followed Sargon's footsteps, leading campaigns to the north and the west. He destroyed the city of Ebla, which had since grown and was becoming the center of a regional kingdom 
which could have rivaled Akkadian power. He campaigned into the Zagros Mountains again, subjugated the people known as the Lulubi, and possibly also skirmished with the Gutians, whom we had met before. He then turned to and destroyed Elam once and for all. Well, not once and for all, Elam would rise again. But by all measures, he generally maintained a neutral policy towards the Persian Gulf, as sea trade continued to flow into Mesopotamia. So he changed imperial strategy again and maintained good relations with Dilmun. We know this from some diplomatic correspondence. He maintained good relations perhaps with Magan and also most likely with Meluha, as there is increased trade between these two regions during this time, during the reign of Naram Sin. So, Naram Sin was a great king and he deserves an entire lecture of his own. Now we're moving towards closing, so let's just discuss a few geopolitical lessons from this presentation, which, uh, which in, in parts might have verged on what you might call speculative history. But I believe uh, even speculative history is a good exercise for testing geopolitical theory. So what are the insights that we can draw from this discussion? The biggest in terms of world system theory is that the expansion of empires can be understood as motivated by the desire for controlling trade routes. Remember this geopolitics and geoeconomics nexus is something that empires and kings always seek to manipulate. And they have to find a balance between that. Second, while controlling land trade is an important prerequisite for maintaining an empire's frontiers, as all empires are ultimately based on land. So, but the costs entailed in attempting to control sea trade generally far outweigh the benefits of maintaining a laissez-faire open sea policy. Again, the important comparison is with Athens and Sparta, in the Peloponnesian War. I keep coming back to that example because you see so many parallels in this geopolitical system. Now, in terms of the management of empires, we see how land reforms initiated by Sargon and continued by his sons and creating this proto-feudal class was so important for building imperial power, that is power that is free from the control of cities. Now, cities throughout the history have all, always had this antagonistic relationship with kings. So kings generally try to base their power in feudal lords outside based in the countryside. Again, this is a pattern which repeats throughout history. Especially we see this a lot in European history, how there is a conflict between kings, cities, and dukes and other lords based in the countryside. Again, this is a pattern which begins to develop during the Akkadian Empire. Now, of course, some cities are built from the ground up by emperors as imperial capitals and fortresses, and they have their own benefits. Perhaps Sutkagendor was one such city, and perhaps Akkad was one such city. Mohenjo-daro could have been a similar city. And later on, we see many empires and emperors building cities. Of course, Alexander the Great had this urban urbanomania of <laughs> building, building cities everywhere, and all named Alexander after him as Alexandria's. Of course, one was not named after Alexander, so he named it after his horse. Finally, we see the value or costs of this idea of divine kingship, which again is something that Alexander the Great would also use to great benefit. Now, Sargon had declared himself the son of a goddess. Naram Sin took it one level up and literally declared himself a god, a god king. Perhaps he borrowed that from Egypt with which now there were more relations. Again, these are speculations. It might have helped the house of Sargon to build some legitimacy in terms of empire building, again reaching out directly to the people instead of the intermediaries of the old religious classes. But it also drew the ire and the anger of the old religious classes. And remember, these are the people who had this power of writing in their hand. Writing was controlled by temples and scribes. And they hated the emperors of Akkad. And later wrote these series of essays, which became a genre in itself called The Curse of Akkad Poetry. And they literally cursed the emperors of God for ages and ages to come. Perhaps there's a lesson there as well. Do not anger the people who write history. Or they are going to write a certain type of history about you. Finally, there's a lesson in the fall of Akkad as well. And let's talk about this briefly. The Akkadian Empire lasted for only six or seven decades after Naram Sin. After a more or less successful reign by his successor Shar Kali Shari, the realm broke out again into civil war. The signs for breakdown already existed again during the final days of Naram Sin, which, like his grandfather, ended in revolt. Shar Kalishari suppressed the internal revolts and was immediately faced with the threat of invasion by the Gutians or the Guti. After some setbacks, the Guti were pushed back, 
but the incursions on the frontier continued. There was a four-cornered contest after Shar Kalishari's death, and the throne finally went to a man named Dudu. The kinglist of Sumeria states at this point, who was king, who was not king? Ikiki, Imi, Nanun, Ilulu, four of them ruled for only three years. But order was finally restored by Dudu, who we are not certain if he was from the house of Sargon or a local lord, so perhaps one of those estate lords or manor lords who had been created by the first three emperors, now became king in his own right. Again, a pattern that repeats. I keep reiterating these patterns because that is ultimately our purpose in exploring this. So Dudu ruled for 21 years, during which the Guti continued to gain momentum and encroach on the frontiers. And by the time of his successor, Shutu Rul, the empire was most likely reduced to a core around Akkad, the city of Akkad, which became the final stronghold of the Akkadian dynasty. The final blow came as the Guti struck, conquered Akkad, and then all of Sumeria. They would rule Mesopotamia for almost a hundred years. It would lead to the creation of the prophetic myth of the Uman Manda, the myth of a fearful invasion by northern barbarians, which would occur throughout history when the kings and the people fail to honor the gods, tradition and just ways, or worse, if they angered the gods. Now there is an irony in this. Sargon, remember, had claimed to be the beloved of the gods, but ultimately the religious order or the people who hold the religious scriptures and various other theological injunctions in their hand claimed that this fall of the empire of Akkad had happened because the gods had been anchored and Sargon himself, who claimed to be the restorer of divine order, had been its ultimate corrupter. So did the Akkadian empire fall due to overextension? In the view of, uh, of many scholars of the Akkadian empire, perhaps this empire itself was an anomaly in an age where communications and logistics was so difficult to maintain and that the empire rose and existed even for a brief amount of time shows the genius of state building and empire building in a sense of the first three or four kings of the Akkadian dynasty. And what became of the other participants in the civilizational great war? We have spoken about Magan and Dilmun. Let's speak briefly about Elam. Now Elam was briefly destroyed and subjugated, but it rose again. And in fact, later kings of Elam would become so powerful that they would raid the cities of Sumeria and even rule Sumeria and Mesopotamia briefly. In fact, the title of the king of Elam continued till the age of Cyrus, who even briefly became the king of Elam and claimed that title as his own. What of the Indus Valley civilization, the Harappans, the Miluhans? The Miluhans too were most likely changed by this encounter. Now, my hypothesis is that through the encounter with this international system, and by the use of mercenaries or other such local recruited armies, the Harappans too began to change and began to transform. And this is something that I will devote substantial time to discussing in my next presentation. When I discuss the presence of Indo-Europeans in the Indus Valley civilization. To give you a hint of what the overarching theme is going to be. Now, I've spoken about previously this idea of interactions, movement and settlement, which happened throughout this age in the post Ice Age era. So I've spoken about a 10,000 year old world system in which people were interacting with each other, moving and settling, or call them whatever you want, Proto-Indo-Europeans, people of the steppes, this or that culture, were also participating in the system. Because we have evidence of the system, these nomads, the so-called Amorites, the people of Martu, and various other people who are interacting with each other. And we have evidence of settlements of the Indus Valley people in the Oxus. We have some hints that the Oxus people also settled and lived in Indus Valley cities. And of course, we spoke about the Harappan diaspora in the Persian Gulf. So I believe this, this mystery we tend to have about ancient history, or where so-and-so people came from, and if so-and-so people interacted with each other, is a question of the early 20th century. So people spoke about this in the 1920s and 1930s. But from the 50s, 60s, 70s, we are beginning to learn so much more about history. And as we come into the 21st century, we have so many new methods and we have a convergence of so many new disciplines that we should demystify this subject. And there is no question about whether people from one region in this entire Indo-Mediterranean arc interacted with each other or not. 
So if the Indo-Europeans existed at the periphery of the system, and there was a presence of the Harappans at the periphery, there is no question that they interacted with people of the Indus Valley. And in fact, we have evidence that in the 3rd millennium BC, early 3rd millennium BC, some Indo-Europeans -Euro might have resided in the Indus Valley. And this is the evidence that I'm going to discuss in the next presentation. I will also discuss there the rise of Indo-Aryan kingdoms in the Indus Valley region, which, in my view, happened after the fall or the transformation of the Harappan civilization. As a transformation, remember I spoke about this conflict between the city and the countryside. So in my view, there were two overlapping civilizations in the greater Indus Valley region. One in the cities and one in the countryside. And as the cities began to decline, the countryside became more powerful. And the lords, local lords from the countryside, began to establish their kingdom just as they did in Mesopotamia, just as they have done across history.